I am reading from chapter 12, verse number 2. If you have your Bible, please. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The book of Hebrews has portrayed three thoughts. Making a study of this book, we find that Jesus Christ, our great apostle, left heaven and came from God to us. Number two, Jesus Christ, no longer an apostle, but he became our high priest. And he went from us back to God. And number three, portrays Jesus Christ as bringing us back with him to enjoy all the beauties that he has prepared for us. And that's what this thought that I want to preach about today and over the next few days. But you that are under the tent tonight, you will get it in its complete entirety. Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. What he has started, he's going to complete it. Can you shout amen, somebody? That puts a thrill in my soul. I'm not looking to backslide. I'm looking for the end. Can you shout amen, somebody? He is the author and he is the finisher of our faith. Now, there are three things that I want you to see. First of all, Jesus Christ is the pattern for our faith. Looking unto Jesus, not man. Don't look to man. Man will mess you up. If you follow a man, you'll end up like those folks did that followed Jim Jones to Guyana. If you don't follow no church, because the church will keep you from the fullness. If you want to follow somebody, look to Jesus and make sure that you follow him. Can you shout amen, somebody? Jesus Christ is called the prince leader. He is the forerunner. He is our leader. Jesus Christ is the one that we are to look at because Jesus was the one, even in his own life, he lived by faith. And he's not asking us to do anything that he did not do. In his early childhood, there's so much of it that is obscured in the Gospels. But what we do know and what we read, we find Jesus was skilled in the Word of God. He studied the Holy Scriptures. He gave the Word out and he even talked to lawyers and doctors and they were puzzled at the wisdom that this young lad had. Jesus spent his time in the Word of God. No wonder he was a man of faith. And God expects us to be children of faith. We've got to learn how to live by faith. And if we're going to have faith, we've got to spend time in the Word of God. Can you shout amen with me, somebody? I know some folks don't like to hear this because many people do not read their Bible. All they do is carry it to church with them. They read the TV guide more than they read the Bible. They read the newspaper more than they read the Bible. They have magazines coming into their home. Now, I like to read magazines, but there's nothing that can satisfy the soul and that can encourage your faith like the Word of God. And this is the foundation of God's faith in your heart to have it rooted and grounded in the Word of God. Can you shout praise the Lord? Later on in his life, when he reached the age of 30, 
He saw John the Baptist baptizing in the Jordan. And Jesus walked right into the water and said, John, I want you to baptize me. He said, Lord, I'm not worthy to untie the shoelaces that you have. He said, suffer it to be so now. And John took him down into the water. And when he come up out of the water the first time, he heard the voice of his father since he was on this earth. It thundered forth and everybody round about heard his voice and he said this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased can you shout praise the Lord with me somebody wouldn't it be wonderful to hear his voice saying this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased and no longer when he heard the voice of his father the Bible says he was led of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil after he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights what am I trying to tell you I'm trying to tell you that Jesus lived by faith just like you and I live by faith. He's not asking you to live any different than he lived. He solely depended upon the leading of the Holy Spirit. And he used the word as his weapon against the attack of the devil. And his faith was challenged. And I want you to know when you have faith in God, that faith has to be challenged. Faith is a battle. Faith is a fight. But I want you to know this is not your battle, but it's God's battle. And you are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ, your Lord. Can you shout amen, somebody? The devil comes out against him and he says, if... Thou be the Son of God. In other words, let me paraphrase it. He's saying, what? You're trying to say you are the Son of God in this desolate condition? This mess that you're... Why, you don't even have enough food to keep your body nourished. If you be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. How many times have he come to you and said, you claim to be a Christian and you can't even pay your rent? You claim to be a child of God and the trouble you're going through, your faith has to be battled. But just like Jesus hung in there, he didn't give in to the onslaught of the enemy, but he took the weapon of his warfare and he said, Satan, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Oh, have Hallelujah. What I'm trying to tell you is that Jesus lived by faith. And if you're going to live, it's going to have to be by the faith of God that he gives to every one of us. Can you shout amen with me, somebody? Hallelujah. He conquered him. Listen to me, beloved. Jesus divested himself of all of his divinity and his power. And he used the only weapon that we have at our disposal. Jesus lived like a man. And he put the devil where he belonged. Just like a man. Just like you and I can do. When the devil comes out against you, don't run from him. But turn around and eyeball him. And say, you lying wonder, it is written. By his stripes I am healed. You can put all the pain you want to. You can knock me down. But I'm not out yet because I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. I have the victory because I'm his child. My faith isn't based in what I feel or how I look. But my faith is based in the bedrock of his word. Can you shout amen? Jesus lived by faith when he commanded the fig tree to die. Jesus lived by faith when he stood at Lazarus' grave. When everybody was looking at him like he lost his mind. But he just stood erect and shouted, Lazarus, come forth. And at the response of faith, he that was dead, four days decomposition setting into his body. The flesh going back to the dust got up. He couldn't even stay in the sepulcher. And he walked out delivered. God brought him back to life because of the faith of God. And I come to tell you, you have the same kind of faith. Hallelujah. Put your hands up.
and rejoice with me, everybody. I'm talking about faith. Oh, hallelujah. I'm reading from Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to get beside myself here. I can feel it coming on. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the one that started us on the journey. And he's the one that's going to see us through. Can you shout amen with me, somebody? Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is not only the pattern for our faith, but he's the author of our faith. Now, here is where the parallel stops. All through the book of Hebrews and all through the 11th chapter, the Holy Spirit uses Old Testament patriarchs. By faith, Enoch. By faith, Abel. By faith, Noah. Through faith, Sarah. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Moses. But now in the 12th chapter, he's saying, forget all that mess now and look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of your faith. That sends chill bumps up and down my spine. It reminds me of the time when Jesus went to the Mount of Transfiguration with three of his chosen disciples, Peter, James, and John. And while they were there, all of a sudden, here comes Moses and Elijah back. And Peter and John and James, being Hebrews that they were, got so taken up with Moses and Elijah, and God had to put a stop to it and whisk them out of there and said, This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus is the principal one. He is the author of our faith. Can you shout amen, somebody? This is where the parallel ends. We cannot draw faith from Abraham, even though we are called the sons of Abraham. But if when we look at Jesus, who is the author of our faith, we can draw his faith. We can draw from him because we are his children. Can you shout amen with me? Three ways that we can draw faith from him. Number one, by his words. All through the Gospels, if you have a red letter edition of the Bible, I don't know about you, but I love to read them red letters because I know that's the words of Jesus. Jesus planted faith into the life of everyone that he came in contact with by his words. This is the reason why we need to read the Word and study the Word so that His faith is transmitted into our life. And then actually, when you and I begin to use that faith, it's not our faith. But it's His faith. Do you remember when Jesus cursed the fig tree and the next day after He destroyed the tables of the money changers and he whipped those that sold doves and changed money. The next day he come back and saw that tree lying on its side, dead from the roots up. Peter began to rejoice and the rest of the disciples and Jesus said something to them, have faith in God. Now the literal translation of that is, you can have faith. The faith of God. In other words, he's saying, you can do the same thing. Oh, I like that. You can do the same thing. He said, do you see that mountain? If you speak to the mountain and say, now he's telling them how to do it. And say to that mountain, mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. And if you don't doubt in your heart, 
The mountain has to obey your words. Oh, hallelujah. And when I see that videotape in Africa, when I put my fingers in the deaf ears of those that were born deaf and dumb, and I put my finger on the dumb tongue, I said, in the name of Jesus. It's no magic in that name. There's no magic in that name. It's the faith of God. He's given me authority to use that name. I'm his representative. I didn't come to talk about him. I come to talk for him. I'm here in his stead. He represents me before the Father. I represent him down here on earth. Can you shout amen? I put my fingers in those deaf ears, put my thumb on the dumb tongue, and I said in the name of Jesus, I command the deaf and dumb spirit, come out! And instantly the ears opened and they began to talk for the first time. This is what I'm talking about. We can draw from his words. But oh, it doesn't stop there. We draw faith not only from his words, but from his finished work. Oh, that's what it's all about, beloved. Your faith never gets too far away from Calvary. This is where it didn't end. This is where it started. This is what it's all about. Those demon spirits thought that they had him. They were around the cross wringing their hands saying, we finally got him. The one that did more damage to the devil's kingdom than anybody that ever lived since the time of Adam. Jesus went about doing good, healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil. He cast out devils. He destroyed the kingdom of the enemy. He destroyed his works every time he came around it. And now those demon spirits are around Mount Calvary and they think this is his end. But they don't know it. He is going to seal their doom because he has to die. He has to be buried. But that is not the end. On the third day, he is coming out of the grave with the hosts of all the doomed. He unlocked the cells of the departed saints and moved them out of Hades into a paradise. Can you shout amen? He took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. His atoning work. All that is behind him, beloved. Oh, prayers might not mean much to you, but when you use the name of Jesus, it means a little bit more. It's just not words beating off the canvas or bouncing off the ceiling. But when you say in the name of Jesus, demons begin to tremble because there is power in that name. And God has given every one of his children the authority to use that name. He said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, name he will give it to you oh hallelujah 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 not just by his words not just by his finished work on calvary but he goes a little step further and i like this he gives us something within which is the power of the holy ghost Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost that He has put within us, the same spirit of trust and confidence that He had. Jesus, when you read His life in the Gospels, He says, the words that I speak are not my words, but they're the words of Him that sent me. He said, I can do nothing without my Father. And Jesus says, you can do nothing without me. Oh, with that same kind of confidence. This is not a hope so thing. I'm not laying hands on you hoping you're going to get well. But I have such confidence in God's Word that when I lay hands on you, there's only one alternative. And that is, get up out of that sick bed. Be thou healed. Be thou delivered. If you're an alcoholic when I lay hands on you you're going to be clean if you're bound by nicotine when I lay hands on you you'll never smoke another cigarette when I lay hands on you in the name of Jesus you will be transformed by the power of God because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world the faith of God beats 
in my breast. Can you raise your hands and shout amen, somebody? Woo! Lord, I feel like getting this thing right now. Turn around, get somebody by the hand and say, Tonight's my night for a miracle. Tonight is my night for a miracle. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm reading from the 12th chapter of Hebrews. Continuing in that second verse. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He's not just the pattern of our faith, but he is the author of our faith. But not only is he the author of our faith, but I like this word, he is the finisher of our faith. Oh, hallelujah. Beloved, I come to town to tell you that he's going to keep you. I said he's going to keep you. He's the finisher of our faith. Jesus Christ was crucified on Calvary. He was buried. On the third day he arose and he ascended to the throne of God and sat down at his right hand. He is your personal high priest. Hear me? If Jesus made it in, I'm going to make it in. <laughs> Woo! That makes me want to holler. I said, that makes me want to holler. Jesus didn't enter in just for himself. But he went there so he could take us back with him. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. But I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. My God, I'm not looking to backslide. It's taken him 2,000 years to build that place. And one of these days, he's coming back to pick old Sam back up. And he's going to take me with him. So that I'll be ever, forever, forever with Him. Go ahead and shout a little bit. Woo! Man, that makes me want to holler. Thank you, Jesus. Ah. Some of you dear saints that are listening to me on radio, you say, oh, Brother Shamba, the man, you don't know what I'm going through. Oh, yes, I do, honey. I'm probably going through something worse than you are. But this is where you've got to learn how to put your faith to work. Can you shout amen? amen? One of the most reassuring scriptures that you can find in the entire Bible is when Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Satan hath desired you to sift you as wheat. Now stop right there. Saint of God, I don't care who you are, struggling saint, backslidden saint, Satan hath desired you. The devil couldn't stop you from coming to Christ. Thank God you got saved. But now that you're saved, the very onslaught of hell is against you. It seems like there's no way out. You may seem that you're at the lowest ebb, but I want you to hang in there. Jesus said something to Peter. He said, Simon, Satan hath desired you to sift you as wheat, but, I like that word, but, but I have prayed for you. <laughs> Woo! But I have prayed for you. Why? Here it is. That your faith fail not. Pardon me while I holler a little bit. Hallelujah. Listen. Simon had a contemporary. The one that sold Jesus out. Jews of Judas. Don't you think Jesus prayed for him also? Don't you think Satan hath desired Judas just like he desired Simon? Absolutely. 
The, pro- the problem was not that one was sorrowful than the other. I've heard preachers preach that Peter was sorry for his act, but I don't believe it was that. I believe the difference is that one person's faith failed not and the other one failed. Faith is what I'm talking about. And I believe this is the key. Jesus said, I have prayed that your faith fail not. Beloved, I want you to know that if Jesus prayed for Peter, he don't love old Peter more than he loves Shambach. I want you to know I have a personal high priest that's right in the holy of holies that's seated right next to the throne of God on the right hand. Can you shout amen somebody? Hallelujah! And his faith is keeping me. There was a congressman in New York, a black congressman by the name of Adam Clayton Powell who died. He was a preacher who was in the Congress. You remember the name? And he had an expression always he'd say, keep the faith, baby. That was what he always used. But I'm not talking about a faith that you can keep. I'm talking about a faith that will keep you. Are you listening to me? Because sometimes your faith gets weak. Sometimes that old faith, that shield of faith gets battered when you're out there fighting the enemy. You're taking blow after blow and sometimes you're lying on the flat of your back. And that shield of faith has been so battered because you have been in so many conflicts. And the devil may have knocked that shield out of your hand and you say, I ain't got no more faith. Don't you admit that to the devil at all. Even though the devil knocks that shield out of your hand, there is a buckler that's been shackled right to your wrist. The devil may knock it out of your hands and may have you lying on the flat of your back. But Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you even to the end of the age he's with you in the battle the conflict is not yours he's not only going to keep you but he's going to educate you educate you in faith hear me beloved This is the process that God uses of putting you and me in situations that we can't get out of and we say, what am I going to do? And I can see Jesus laughing, saying, well, use what I put in your hand. Use faith. This is why he put you in that situation. This is the reason why the doors are closed. This is the reason why you don't have but five cents in your pocket. Hang in there. Your faith is going to work. God's going to turn it around. Hallelujah. He said, if you will keep my statutes and walk in my ways, he said, all of these blessings will come upon you. You are a blessed child of God. He has put something within your breast that he used. And I'm talking about the faith of God. He said, I'll bless you in the city. And I'll bless you in the country. I'll bless your basket. And I'll bless your store. I'll bless the fruit of your womb. I'll bless your seed. I'll make you the head and not the tail. He said, you shall lend and not borrow. He said, everything you set your hands to, I will bless it if you walk in my ways. Keep my commandments. Be obedient unto my voice. All of these blessings will come upon you and you shall be blessed. Let me hear you shout, I'm blessed. Shout it out loud. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Just like the eagle. The eagle just hatched out one of the little eaglets and he feels so comfortable in the nest. But when that little eaglet gets big enough, that big eagle will pick it up and soar into the heights. The little eaglet ain't never been out of the nest. And the big eagle drops him. Oh, my papa don't love me kicked me out of the house what am I going to do I see Papa flying around he said well I'm going to start acting like he is 
And he starts flapping them wings and all of a sudden, <laughs> look at this. I can do what Papa can do. <laughs> I come to tell you, you got faith, but you haven't learned how to put it to work yet. And God's dropping you into situations where you've never been. Stop complaining. Stop talking about the pastor. Stop talking about some of the church members. But start flapping them wings of faith and put them to work. And God's going to bring you through. You'll be more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. Because you've learned how to have faith. You've learned how to put your wings to work. And you now have eagle sense. Raise your hands and shout praise the Lord. Wait. Just turn around and look at somebody and say, Do you know the devil's a liar? I want you to get mad at him. Do you know the devil is a liar? Hebrews chapter 12. You don't mind if I finish this quick, do you? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. I've been on this for three days, and this will be the last one. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The pattern of our faith, the author of our faith, the finisher of our faith, and the climax of it all, what should our attitude be toward the author and the finisher of our faith? What is my reaction to all this? And we have it listed right here in the Word of God. First, first of all, it says, let us look to Him. Look as our example. We preachers, sometimes we get so full of pride that we want to hold consultations and tell folks what to do when they get in trouble. And most of the trouble the saints are having, you ain't never had. So if you're going to look to somebody for help, go to the one that's already been through this mess. <laughs> Come on, shout amen, somebody. Looking unto, say it out loud, Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. He is my example. I'll tell you, beloved, there ain't nobody that endured like Jesus did. He endured the cross and suffered the shame. And the agony went through it all. In the book of Isaiah, I have this written down. I got it underlined, rather, in the book of Isaiah, the 50th chapter. Listen. The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters. And my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hadn't, I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me, who will contend with me. Let us stand together, who is mine, who is mine adversary, let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God will help me, who is he that shall condemn me. Lo, they all shall wax old as a garment, and the moth shall eat them up. Jesus Christ went through all this for you and for me. And in this 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews, it goes on to relate what he endured, the suffering and the agony of the cross. In fact, he got so that 
he almost turned back. And he cried out and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Have you ever gone through such distress you can't even feel his presence around your side? And it seems like he turned his face from you. Jesus, he died alone on Calvary. The father's eyes were taken off of him. Not because he didn't love his son. But I've come to tell you that God is a holy God. And while Jesus was hanging there on Golgotha's hill on Mount Calvary, he was carrying the sins of the whole world in his body and the righteousness of God could not stand to see the sin that his own son was carrying and his holiness had to turn his face away from him. He carried your shame. He carried your sin. Aren't you glad he didn't give up? But he stayed true. He was born to die in order that you and I might have life and have it more abundantly. Oh, hallelujah. Looking unto Jesus, He is our Prince Leader, beloved. He's the one that we should look to. Look to Him as the guarantee of our victory. If He became victorious, then we are victorious. Hallelujah. If Jesus defeated the devil, then we can keep Him in that position. He put his foot on his neck and rendered him powerless and helpless. And it's up to you and me to keep the devil where he belongs. Hallelujah. We are guaranteed the victory when we look at him. And when we look at his finished work, it's finished. On Calvary, before he gave up the ghost, he cried out, It is finished. Hey, nothing you can add to it, beloved. It's finished. That means it's done. Hallelujah. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. Look to Him for help as we run the race. Are you listening? Don't just run and don't just look. Look while you run and run while you look. <laughs> Looking unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. There's something about looking. You can look at that sunset, and as a result of your looking, immediately that sunset is indelibly on your mind. Take a picture and focus it. That photographic plate is on the object that you're shooting at in one little click. The thing that you're looking at is transposed. Got the picture. Are you listening to me? Put it on a microscope and it'll reveal things that the naked eye cannot see. There's a certain power connected with looking. Looking unto Jesus. Something that you can see that the world can't see. Say amen with me, somebody. Do you remember when God brought his ancient people out of bondage and out of captivity when they were going around in the wilderness? All of a sudden, the snakes and the vipers began to bite God's people. Now, there was a time when the snakes didn't eat God's people. They were just going around biting everybody but God's people. But because of their backslidden nature, God lifted their protection from them. Just to bring the people back to God. And the snakes started biting God's people and they were dying. And they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us. Aren't you glad he's a merciful God? God said to Moses, set up a serpent of brass in the wilderness. Put him on a pole, which is symbolic of the cross. And tell everyone that's been bitten by the serpent, all they got to do is look. And when they look, they shall live. Oh, hallelujah. A little boy who was snake bit, lying on a dying bed, took one glimpse and saw the serpent hanging on a tree. And when he saw it, new life came into his being. And I want you to know this is how the healing power of God comes to you. Don't look to a man that has the gift of healing or the gift of a word of wisdom, but look unto Jesus. Look beyond the preacher. Look beyond the bottle of oil. Look beyond the pastor and behold the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. The Lamb of God that taketh away
away the sin of the world. One glimpse of Him and your sin will be washed away. One look at Jesus as the healer of your body. And the sickness got to vanish. This is not magic. This is reality. The author and the finisher of your faith. Looking to Jesus. Looking away from yourself. Looking away from the church. Looking away from the world. And beholding him. Looking unto Jesus. Who is the author. And the finisher. Of my faith. Can you shout praise the Lord with me somebody. This faith. You possess it. You got it. But it won't do you any good. Until you learn how to put it to work. And we're going to put it to work right now. Everybody stand to your feet. Raise both hands toward heaven. And let's begin to praise him just a little bit. Praise him just a little bit. Praise him just. chapter of 2 Kings and I will use verse 2 as a text. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord saying, and he has this prayer repeated. Not long ago, I was receiving directions on how to get somewhere. Just like a multitude of you people that are under this tent. You listen to me on radio to tell you how to get to the tent. And I don't know how many people stopped me before the service and said, Man, did I make a wrong turn. I've been driving since 6 o'clock and I couldn't find this place. How many of you here within the sound of my voice ever made a wrong turn? Let me see your hand. If you never have made a wrong turn, you ain't never gone anywhere. But tonight I don't want to talk about no wrong turn. I want to talk about a right turn. I would like you to make the right kind of a turn in order to find deliverance. If you are still in your sin, you are hell bound and you made the wrong turn. And you need to make a right turn. If you are sick or diseased in your body then you need to make a right turn in order to be healed and delivered by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have never received the gift of the Holy Ghost, you say, Brother Shambach, I have been seeking for the Holy Ghost for 20 years, but I still don't have Him. You need to make a right turn. 
You don't have to seek for him. He is not lost. He is here right now and all you have to do is make the right turn and receive the Holy Ghost and you will have power in your life. Can you shout praise the Lord somebody? I'd like to read this story about Hezekiah. In the first verse, and I told my live audience to underline this in their minds. The very first phrase, in those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. This is a beautiful message on that one particular phrase. There is a sickness unto death. And there is a sickness which is not unto death. And if it is a sickness unto death, there is nothing that can get it healed. But yet he got his healed. In the New Testament, Lazarus was sick. And the Bible said it was a sickness that was not under death and he died. Kind of confusing, isn't it? And just the direct opposite. But I just want to say this to try to get your mind to thinking. I don't care what kind of trouble you are engaged in. I don't care what medical science has said about your case. If they shook their head and said, you are going to die and not live, my Bible says, you shall live and not die, and I refuse to believe the doctor's report. I believe that we can receive anything from God. I don't care what it is. If we will pay the price... And do what God calls us to do. And we become obedient to the word of God. Then you will be the recipient of that miracle. Hezekiah was sick unto death. And it was so pronounced that God even sent one of his prophets to him. To tell him to get his house in order. And Isaiah was not an ordinary run-of-the-mill prophet. He was one of the biggies. One of the major prophets. And he walked right into the bedchamber of the king, if you please. Unannounced. He didn't say, good morning, God bless you, how are you? He just walked in and said, thus saith the Lord. I kind of like that kind of prophet, don't you? He's not using his own words, but he uses only the word of God. And he walks into the bedchamber of the king and said, Thus saith the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Now this is kind of convincing, isn't it? You'd think now since God sent a prophet on a special delivery message, on, on, a, on a special delivery message, that he's going to die and set his house in order, you would think that there would be no hope. And a real prophet of God, when he delivers a message, he will not stop to talk to you about the time of day, but he turns right around and walks on out of there. But in the meantime, Isaiah did something. Not Isaiah, but Hezekiah. If a preacher told you you were going to die, you know what you'd do? You'd say... Call the family in. Not only the preacher. Let me bring it a little closer to home. If your doctor told you you were going to die. I know folks don't like to hear this, but I'm going to put it right on radio. Doctors sometimes tell you you have so long to live. You have a week to live and then you're going to die. And many of you believe the doctor's report. You make sure your insurance is paid up. You make sure you have the burial plot already laid out. You make sure your children come and get their last look at you. 
But here was a man who refused to take the message from the prophet of God. And no sooner when the prophet got out of the room, the Bible says he turned his face to the wall and he prayed. Can you shout praise the Lord? He turned his face to the wall. He refused to accept the message even from God. I'm boarding on theology now and some of you may not agree with what I'm going to tell you but it comes right out of the book. And I love to, I love to preach on this particular message because here is a man that refused to take the message from the prophet of God. And I preach this way tonight to try to encourage you. I don't care what kind of trouble you're going through. If you will make the right turn, God will hear your cry from heaven and He will perform a miracle in your life and give you your heart's desire. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord somebody? Hallelujah! Turn around there in your seat and tell somebody, say, this is my night for a miracle. You in your homes, just go ahead and say it if you will. This is my night for a miracle. He turned his face to the wall and he prayed. Thank God we have a God that we can call on. The world don't know how to pray, but we are children of God. His ear is always open to our cry. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. God not only hears our prayer, but He answers our prayer. Can you raise your hands and shout praise the Lord with me? I come to tell you there's a way out. If you're hooked on drugs, He'll set you free. If you're bound by alcohol, He'll deliver you and set you free. If you're hooked on nicotine, God will deliver you and set you free. No matter what your bondage is, He is here tonight to deliver you and to grant you the desire of your heart. But you have to make the right turn. And the right turn is prayer. And calling on the name of the Lord. And He will give you the desire of your heart. Hallelujah. Raise both hands and let me hear you shout hallelujah. I'm reading from chapter 20 of 2 Kings. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord. Talking about Hezekiah the king, if you please. A man who just had a prophet come right into his bedchamber and say, Thus saith the Lord, Thou shalt not live, but you shall surely die. Set your house in order. But he didn't pray right. I thought that would get you quiet. I said he didn't pray right. Read it. He said, O Lord, remember Now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which was right in your sight. Boy, if you don't sound like them Pentecostal saints I preach to. They are perfect. Woo-hoo. Now if you can't holler amen, holler ouch. And I'll know you're still hanging around. I don't care who you are, in your own sight, you are perfect. We are God's choice. Now, let me sort of nail this thing down right now. If he was so perfect, how come God sent a prophet to him to tell him to get his house in order? It must have been out of order. And when you read in Second Chronicles about Hezekiah, you will find the true story of the sins that he had committed. Somebody says, yeah, but he got the answer. I know he did. And I'll get into that a little later. 
But first of all, I want to show you that he prayed wrong. When you pray, you don't tell God how good you are. You tell him how much in need you are. And you will find this in the 38th chapter of Isaiah. This is the same story. You see, when he turned his face to the wall, all he saw was his own reflection. And all he could see was his own goodness. But after looking at yourself all that time, you want to turn away quick. Because most of us get tired of looking at ourselves. And he turned over. And when he turned over, he looked up. Now he's making the right turn. And when he looked up, this is the kind of language. I don't have time to read it all. It says, O Lord, by these things men live, and in all these things is the life of my spirit. So wilt thou recover me and make me to live. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind my back. He sought deliverance and God gave it to him. Listen to this. The living, the living, he shall praise thee as I do this day. The father to the children shall make known thy truth. The Lord was ready to save me, therefore we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. And when you get your eyes off of your trouble and you begin to look up and see all the goodness of God, you'll want to praise Him with all the joy that you can muster because God is worthy of our praise. Can you shout praise the Lord somebody? You want to learn how to get something from God? Praise Him. I said praise Him. Most folks that I talk to, they say, Well, I'll praise the Lord after I get it. You ain't never going to get it. You've got to learn to praise God before you get it. Because praise is the wings that brings the answer to you. Can you shout praise the Lord somebody? Hallelujah. Some of you never praise God. Our churches were born with a garment of praise. They were born in the spirit of praise. But now our churches have settled down to a cold dead form and ceremony and ritual. But thank God revival is coming back again into the church. And the church is learning how to praise Him in spirit and in truth. Can you raise your hands and rejoice with me everybody? Hallelujah! God said, I will give you the garment of praise. For the spirit of heaviness. How would you like to get rid of that heavy spirit? Put the garment of praise on. Hallelujah. Somebody says, well, I ain't got nothing to praise the Lord for. You're breathing, aren't you? Hallelujah. Do you remember when Jesus gave his disciples power to cure diseases and power to cast out devils? They came back rejoicing. Woo! Hallelujah! Glory to God! Thank you, Jesus! Even the devils are subject to us. Jesus said, hold it, boys. Don't rejoice because devils are subject to you. But if you want to rejoice, rejoice because your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. <laughs> Hallelujah. So every one of you that are children of God and you are born again and your sins are washed away and your names are written in the Lamb's book of life, you are commanded to rejoice and give God praise. Oh, 
Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Rejoice. Now listen. Anybody can rejoice when you're feeling good. Anybody can rejoice when everybody loves you. Anybody can rejoice when your family's intact. Anybody can rejoice when you're loaded with money. Got a bank account and your bills are paid and you're still working. But it takes a child of God to rejoice when the husband walks out on you. When the wife packs up and leaves. When you're laid off of the job. When you're lying on the flat of your back. And you don't have enough money to change a quarter. Don't have any food on the table. But the devil can't steal what God put down around that fifth rib. Can you shout amen somebody? You can rejoice in the Lord, the God of your salvation, who has given you joy. And this is what brings deliverance to the people of God. Hallelujah. This was a man who just got a word from the great prophet Isaiah and says, you're going to die and not live. That'll knock the shout out of anybody. But he learned the secret. Not only did he just turn his face to the wall, but when he rolled over and began to praise God, he found out that God couldn't stand all that praise. You want to get an answer from God? Praise Him. He can't stand all that praise. Just start shouting hallelujah. Glory to God. Bless the Lord. Oh my soul. All that is within me. Bless His holy name. Forget not all His benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Who healeth all thy diseases. Who delivereth thy life from destruction. I'm talking about a God that's waiting to give you your answer when you learn how to praise Him. Woo. I don't know about you, but I feel like shouting a little bit. Praise the Lord! Paul and Silas began to offer praises unto God when they were in jail. And at midnight, God sent an earthquake and delivered the whole jail because he couldn't stand all that praise. It's time to praise God and let Him know that you love Him from the depths of your heart. Raise your hands and rejoice. Second Kings chapter 20. Second verse. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and he prayed. Have you made the right turn? If you're not praising God, you made the wrong turn. When you learn how to praise God, you've made the right turn. I can tell people who made the right turn. Now listen, I could preach all night on this. I love this. When you make the right turn, then God will make the right turn. No sooner did Hezekiah begin to offer praise and give a joyous attitude to God when God stopped Hezekiah. Not Hezekiah, he stopped Isaiah. Isaiah was on his way out. He just gave the message. The Bible says he was getting near the middle court when God stopped and said, Hold it, boy. And Isaiah was such a great prophet of God, he just stopped and said, Yeah, Lord. He said, Turn around! Yeah, Lord. See, when you make the right turn, God makes the right turn, and the prophet starts making a right turn. God said, he said, I'm already around, Lord. God said, go back in and tell him. Tell him I heard his prayer. Isn't that beautiful? How would you like to have God just come and say, I heard your prayer. Ooh, my. I heard, oh, I heard your prayer. Wouldn't you love to hear him say, I heard your prayer? 
Guess what? Look at me, darling. Don't cry. It's time to rejoice. I come to tell you, He heard your prayer. He saw your tears. Oh, He heard your cry. That's what I come to Staten Island to tell you. God has seen your suffering. He's heard your cry. He's heard your prayer. God is going to deliver you. And He's going to set you free. Because He is God. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Listen to me, preachers. Pastors, listen to me. It takes a whole lot of man to back up and to go back and say something different than what you just said. I love Isaiah for this. That would have been one of them so-called prophets today. I ain't going back there. I done gave the word out. That's why I know this is a man of God. He goes back in and he got to eat every word he said. And he stands in front of Hezekiah and said, Thus saith the Lord, I've heard your prayer and I'm going to give you 15 more years. Get up out of that bed and be thou here. <laughs> Woo! Do you know what God did? I'm going to make it so fantastic it'll drive you right out of your seat. You know what God did? He found a man that could change the mind of God. Wow. He literally changed God's mind. Because God sent his prophet in there to tell him he's going to die. And now God said, tell him. I'm going to give him 15 more years. Oh, hallelujah. Hear me, beloved. Some of you people, your doctor told you you have to suffer all the days of your life. Don't you believe it? He ain't no prophet. He ain't nothing but a doctor. The Bible says all things are possible to him that believeth. And I believe God. And God is going to give you your miracle. Uh, every time I read this, I get blessed. Now listen to me. The prophet turned because you made the right turn. And now God's about to turn. And I underline this in my Bible because when God turns, He makes a perfect turn. And I underline this in red and you know what it says here? Listen, let me just read what it says. I have heard, I have seen, I will heal, I will add, I will deliver, I will defend, and I will prove it. Seven I wills. Seven is a perfect number. And when you make the right turn, I want you to know when God does His turn, He does it in a perfect way. And the first thing He says is, I will. Not will. I have. I have heard. Heard what? Thy prayer. I have seen thy tears. I will heal thee. Yet some of you people are sitting there in the church wondering, I don't know whether it's the will of God for me to be healed or not. Well, you better know it's the will of God for you to be healed. I had a lady come to me in my church some years ago when I pastored in Pennsylvania. She was dying with cancer and when she got before me, her body was racked with cancer. Tears began to flow down her eyes and she said, Brother Shambach, God put this on me to make me humble. So I laid hands on her and I said, Lord, give her another one and make her more humble. 
She stopped crying right away and ducked out from my hand and said, I don't want another one. I said, don't worry, Mama. God don't answer prayer like that. He don't pass out cancers. He's the healer. God ain't the one that gives sickness out. He's the healer. He said, I will heal thee. I will heal thee. I will heal thee. I will heal thee. Don't you look at me like that because some of y'all are saying the same thing. So I just stopped and I looked at her. I said, suppose we pray for everybody in the church and ask God to give them all the cancer and make them humble. Oh, she said, I don't want them folks to have what I got. I said, that's strange. Whenever I get something from God, I want everybody to have it. And she said, I don't want them to have this. I said, are you going to the doctor for this thing? She said, I go three times a week. I said, you're a hypocrite. She said, Brother Shambach, I am not. I said, yes, you are. You told me God put it on you. Now you're paying a doctor to take off of you what God put on you. I said, why don't you keep the thing and die and I'll give you a good funeral. You know what she said to me? Well, she said, brother, I ain't got no faith. I said, now you're getting someplace. She said, I am? I said, yeah, you're asking for help. You don't have any faith. I said, now you're going to get some. And I laid hands on her in the name of Jesus and commanded that cancer to die. I did that about 30 years ago and that woman's still alive today in the same church shouting and praising God because God said, I will, I will, I will heal thee. I will heal thee. It is the will of God for you to be healed. It's God's will for you to be saved. It's God's will for you to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Can you shout praise the Lord? Praise the Lord! Praise the Lord! Oh, hallelujah. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What He did yesterday, He's still doing today. You said, what did He do yesterday? I've got a record right here in the book of what He did yesterday. He opened blind eyes. He unstopped deaf ears. He made the lame to walk and to rejoice and to leap for joy. And God is the same today. And He's still doing it today. All He is looking for is for people to say, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. All things are possible to him that believeth. Raise both hands and just confess that. Say, Lord, I believe. Say it out loud. Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Lord, I believe. Now raise both hands and just praise him a little bit, will you?